Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. Hey everybody, I'm Yule. Hey, I'm DM Phil. Um, we're going to discuss chapter 12 today, but before that, let's get caught up. In our last episode, Krupp's dream of the past was the venue for Tattersail's rebirth. Whiskey Jack set Sari on the trail of Krupp, and Quickbin prepares to make a desperate deal. That sounded horrible. Reread it. Anyway, all of that took place on a single day, and chapter 12 takes place that night. How are you guys feeling? Pretty good? Yeah. No, I feel we good. I feel good. Are we ready? You know, this, this is kind of crappy, but can we pause just for a second? Because I have to pee. All right, well, let's jump into the preamble, yeah? Yeah, let's do it. You guys get anything out of this? I did. Okay, so do you care to explain? I do. When we met previously, like, none of us had a single clue about what any of that meant. On a strange, like, flash, I read the back. The back of the book? Yeah, I read the back of the book. And I wasn't even really looking for anything in particular, but I did see Absalar in the list of attendants. And this, the preamble, is called Absalar's Cant. And Absalar is the Lady of Thieves. She's an ascendant. Okay. Are you talking about the glossary or something? Uh, whatever's in the back. Yeah, the glossary. Yeah, the, ascend- a... the list of ascendants and all that kind of... I need to read those. Yeah. You know, uh... the thing about uh, the Gardens of the Moon and all the Malazan books, and I think we've said it before, there is an extensive glossary and appendix section at the beginning and at the back of the book. Do you guys like the maps, though? I always find that they were kind of, like, scritchy, and I am a bad map reader anyway, so... Yeah, the maps look like... It's not so clear. The maps look like the maps they had of the New World in about the year 1700. (laughs) Uh, So pretty advanced. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, we didn't have a clue in the beginning... But it says, Walk with me this thieves road, hear its song on her foot, how clear its tone in misstep as it sings you in two. The what I got out of that is that as a rogue, stealth and anonymity and being essentially invisible is the gift of your trade. If you show yourself by misstepping, there's no room for error. And I think that's what it was really implying is that the life of the thief, the thieves road, is High risk, high reward. And if you screw up, you die. Does that make any sense? Yes. No, no, no. I like that. I I like that. How do you guys feel about having these kinds of preambles with people that you don't know? It's nice when you find out about later on. Obviously, a glossary is something that, you know, you can look at at any time. You mean sometimes we get to meet those characters? Meet the characters or at least understand what they're talking about. It's something that, you know, we're experiencing for the first time in the book, but we actually experienced it in poem or in writing or something like that. Or it comes up multiple times, like Gotho's Folly, right? Well, coincidentally, why don't we start talking about the first section? Because I think that something very much like that happens in the very beginning of the first section. Sure thing. Define first section. Right here. Krupp plums ancient tomes in Mammoth's study. And Mamet also has a question for Krupp. Krupp is reading a book, and it is called Aladart's Realm Compendium. And he is, he's like brushing through it, and he's talking about brevity and the lack thereof that's in this tome. It's not just dry. I think it's like, it's not pertinent to what he's after, and it's wordy, right? You guys, we've all played the D&Ds, so we like... Did this make y'all think of a particular Forgotten Realms title by any chance? Maybe Aurora's Whole Realm Catalog? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I thought of immediately. I was like, oh, my God, it's even a lot of the same letters to begin with. But he's reading in this, he's reading in this massive ancient tome, and it's got this long page after page list of stuff. But Krupp is looking for something very specific that kind of ended our last chapter. Krupp is... Searching for evidence of the dragons that Cole mentioned in a, what, a drunken stupor as usual. Five black dragons. And he's like, what? And he's like searching and he comes across this passage about Moonspawn. There's a whole bunch of information that he kind of breezes through. We're not going to talk about that information now. At all? I don't think so. We should warn people that that stuff's super important. 
but it's not important in this book at all. That's late game stuff. I do believe it to be that way, yeah. It's interesting that it's in there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. At least mention it, right? Not this, not to say this. It's about the chain god, whatever that is. Yeah, if you look ahead, it's the title of the last book of the series. Fine, we just said it. That's that's the all we know. Crippled god. Yeah, exactly. A whole bunch of people were there during this event that he's reading about, and he's looking specifically for the mention of five black dragons. I don't know how he knew that list would be there, but he finds it, and then he wonders who it was that was speaking through Cole, because even though Cole was at one time much more than he is now, he was never... Cole was no scholar. He, he was lofty in his position in life, but no scholar. <laughs> I just want to say I am so disappointed that this is how it turned out, because I was completely into it that this drunken idiot just like... Somebody asked a question, and he just blurted out this brilliant piece of drunken bar trivia... <laughs> Because he knew the answer. And then Krupp says, it must have been somebody speaking through his mouth. And I'm like, no! The idiot actually knew! <laughs> Maybe he does. I think Krupp has a sense. I think Krupp... Yeah, he's adept. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, capital A? Um, Probably, huh? This... Okay, so he's following up on something that Cole said at the end of last chapter. Sure, there's a mention of a red dragon also according to this history book, that there were indeed five black dragons there, plus a red dragon. And by there, you mean Moonspawn? Yes. I was wondering if there was a connection between that center spire in the in the middle of the Warren of Chaos and the Fang of Darkness. I don't know. That's what it made me think of, and I went back and read it, but I didn't really see a connection. My memory of the series is super not good anymore. That's why we're doing this, so I can refresh myself also, and uh, fully understand it, hopefully. I mean, yeah. a lot of the comments in the YouTube sections, and please people keep doing it, are really challenging me because I realize that sometimes you guys key on things differently than I am, and it's just like another thing I'm going to have to go back and pay attention to yet again to fully understand everything. You know, it's funny. You can go back and listen to our previous episodes. And every now and then I'm like, holy sh**, Yule knew the answer right there. Like, So it was a couple of, I don't remember, when I drove to Texas, I listened to all the episodes. Okay, up to nine, I think. Philip and I had had this conversation where it was like, oh my God, do you remember at the beginning of one of the chapters, there's a preamble where they're talking about uh, that guy that is the second in command to Caladan Brood, whose name I can't remember right now. Whatever, the guy that had sat on tall thrones and like... That guy, yeah, okay. We were talking, you and I, Philip, about this guy and how Brood had said, you never learn. We had figured out, that, oh, it's because he, he doesn't understand the truism about not being noticed by the gods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, I went back and I listened to all these episodes and I realized Yule caught it right then in the moment and neither one of us did. So by going back and listening, you actually figure out some stuff like, oh, Yule's pretty smart. <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. Phew. Calor. Stuff like Calor. Thank you. We got sidetracked right when Yule figured it out. And that's yeah. why we didn't explore it. Yeah. And that kind of stuff is, yeah, it's good. It's good stuff. All right. So Krupp has gone through. He's found his names, his description of the five black dragons and the one red dragon whose name is what? Solana. Solana. Anyway, so that's all the information he needed. He just kind of wanted to verify that that was an accurate thing and that the Fang of Darkness probably is Moon Spawn. And then he's interrupted by Mammoth, who's bringing him tea. And Mammoth's like, I'm sorry to pry. I'm, I can't help it. I'm just curious. But Krupp is being cagey and will not tell him what he was looking for. He says he was looking for his grandmother. <laughs> yeah, her name's in there. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, exactly. this is an ancient tome, and Krupp is being Krupp, and it's actually really kind of funny. No, it's hilarious. Um, but nevertheless, they relocate to like the sitting room, as it were, to have tea, and the subject turns to Crocus because this is Mammoth, Crocus's uncle, and this is Krupp, who is kind of like his street dad, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Mammoth's worried about Crocus. You know, he's acting weird. He even came up and said he wanted to, like, learn things so he could be a little bit more uh, uh, prestigious in the community. He requested a formal education. Exactly. Mamet asked Krupp, like, what's up? And it's funny that he 
complains about brevity in the writing of the book when he is the, the most non He's, he's the loquacious, least concise. right? Yeah, he's not a concise person not at, at all. all. Yeah, exactly. There's no brevity when it comes to Krupp. Krupp has a paradox. He's got a persona that he always portrays, and then there's the real Krupp, which is like he, his mind is going a million miles a minute, right? Right. Yeah. Personally, his mind is going a million miles a minute. Outside of that, he likes to waste people's time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he totally does. <laughs> So Krupp says, you know, you came to me a long time ago and wanted to make sure I would take care of Crocus because, you know, he's into those uh, those swashbuckling stories and wants to be one of those back alley kind of guys. And Krupp would shepherd him. And he did. He apprenticed Crocus as a thief. Yeah. And Mammoth's perfectly well aware of this fact and doesn't mind. Right. And Krupp says that Crocus even wants to return something that he's fenced. Yeah, he's, he wanted to return some stolen goods. And, well, he's bringing it up to Mammoth, like, you know, oh, this is another thing to, like, maybe be worried about or pay attention to. So do you guys remember a couple chapters ago when Marilio and Ralic were sitting next to that abandoned tower and they were discussing Crocus and how... I think essentially we've got the same thing going on here between two other people that really care for Crocus. That's an interesting connection. They're concerned for Crocus because he is acting strange, but he's of an age and he's showing interest in things and they're not really sure, but Krupp knows why. Right. And he's not telling. Nonetheless, they're very happy and so are the other people at the bar at Phoenix Inn that Crocus might be able to get out of all this and make something of himself, it sounds like. So I, I have an alternative theory. We've been going back and forth about Crocus and his development and why he's doing this and why he's doing that and how he's 17. And that's a stage where you could go down one path or another, right? Several times in this book, we have questioned whether or not Opan is affecting people's decision-making abilities. I wonder if this is one of those times, starting with when he was in that maiden's room and he looked at her. Crocus, yeah. And followed by when he asked for the treasure back. All of this is out of character for him. And I'm not saying he can't change on a dime. I can relate to people changing on a dime. But it just seems odd. And he is the coin bearer. For good or bad, Opan is imprinting his will on Crocus at this time. I mean, that's a very, very likely scenario that you propose. You're correct. He is the coin bearer. There's no reason whatsoever to expect that these little things being noticed by his friends. I mean, look at all the examples we have of our suspected examples. He's talking about Perrin, Tattersail, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I remember. Circle Breaker, all of these folks who they recognize that they did something they don't comprehend, but they did it anyway. Well, do you guys remember there was a discussion of how Opon spreads their influence? And it has to do with dropping the coin on somebody, and then anybody that's associated with the coin bearer is now fair game for Opon. They can reach their tendrils mm -hmm. out from the coin bearer to all of that person's associates. Well, that's what I'm getting at is the very first part of this chapter, the preamble, was Absalar. Opon's intervention into mortal affairs by directly giving the coin to Crocus, a thief, was an invitation to Absalar, Lady of Thieves, to join the Gambit. Okay, that is a very interesting um, uh, proposition that you have made. I'm going to put a pin in it, and then we'll come back and we'll see in the end. Yeah? Moving on. So as Krupp is ruminating on Ralik Nom, Mamet gets a call in his head. Oh, right. They were talking about everybody, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, well, they were talking about the people and how they all have like a special affinity to Crocus. Mamet gets this call from Baruch, and... And Mammoth's all, hey, uh, you got to skedaddle. Baruch wants to talk to you, and then he goes into his little study and closes the door. Right, and what he's doing, and Krupp can hear him, he hears Mammoth flipping the pages. I assume he's he's looking at what Krupp was looking at. The question I have is at the end of the section, it then says, Krupp sighs in relief. So what's he? what's the relief part? Well, did you notice that Krupp was talking out loud? He was. He was. Yeah, so what did he say? He said some stuff that was pretty telling, and then he was relieved. It was kind of like last chapter when he was relieved that he didn't collapse in, f in full view of everybody on the street, it, right? Yeah, and I thought that was really out of character that he would be just verbally putting it all out there. 
I think it's funny that you think that it's out of character when in the very beginning, when we first had Krupp's dream, his very first dream, you went on and on about how Krupp is a crazy person. He is a crazy person. I agree that he's somewhat crazy, but like... This is just an indication that he, he he doesn't have it all together, right? But yeah, he said some stuff. He was revealing information out loud about his his own mind. Well, he slipped up here. That's I think it, what's important. Oh, maybe so. he, he. Well, this is a safe place to slip at. The stuff that he didn't want overheard was the fact that he needs to discern who this woman was that was following him. And he's talking about sorry. First and foremost, Krupp must discern the nature of the woman who followed him, who killed Shirt, and who noted that Crocus saw the blood on her weapon, and who marked Ralik Nam as an assassin with his very arrival. That's what he didn't want overheard. I wonder if he's losing his nerve and he's getting a little rattled. No? I don't think so. Does he seem like he's losing his nerve I don't, to you? When you start talking about this stuff in public instead of just doing it in your mind... Okay. I don't know, man. Like we're talking about Krupp. Yeah, he's such a strange character, and like this doesn't seem out of character. It just seems like, oops, he slipped. And in a way, it is a safe place to slip. But he was keeping five black dragons away from Mammoth, so he obviously likes to keep secrets, right? Hmm. But I, I don't know, but I think that's why he was relieved. But let's talk about sorry real quick. I had speculated that because of that blast of powerful magic that was associated with Shadow. And then being followed by this woman and all the stuff that had to do with the spinning coin inside the Phoenix Inn, that Krupp should be aware that that's the rope. But it seems like he's not aware that she's the rope. A prickly exchange between Crone and Baruch suggests a terrifying Malazan plan in the Gadrobi Hills. Right. So we're with Baruch. Well, actually, we're with Crone. And she is waiting in Baruch's study when Baruch kind of bursts in wrapping a robe around himself. And I want to talk about what we think he was up to right now because it's not important for later and we'll never get back to it if we don't do it now, right? What was he doing? Wherever he was, that he had to be naked. It, I, he, I don't think he was naked. Sleeping? I don't think so, man, because it says later on that less than half an hour ago, he summoned a demon because he needed a spy. Oh, my gosh, you're right. Uh, well, what, like blood magic or something like that? I think he came straight from there, essentially. Uh -huh. Like, he might have might have had to take a bath afterwards. I don't, know. I don't know what you smell like after you summon a demon. He came, essentially, straight from there, or as close to as to make Crone wait. And she's in a foul mood because, as you remember, at the end of last chapter, she was getting blasted by Hairlock's magic. And now her feathers are all ruffled and a little bit singed, and she's in a bad mood. And Baruch knows it and can tell. Yeah. And she's like, let me, let me tell you a story. Well, the story is about uh, initially about how Hairlock, the wooden puppet, was killing all of her people by using his warren, right? Man, it's unclear. And sourced from a warren of chaos. So whatever he's doing is obviously coming from that. I'd like to take a, a pause timeout right now and thank Damien for pointing this out. But note, please, that it says a warren of chaos. Not the Warren of Chaos or Warren of yeah, Chaos. Yeah. Nah, we're getting some comments and some people in the chat and etc. that are like, hey, you guys are getting these things wrong. And I say to you, based on what we've read so far, uh, it's fair that we're getting it wrong. Right. But apparently it's one of the Warrens of Chaos. And apparently the Warren of Chaos is not a Warren like normal Warrens. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it, but I don't think we're supposed to at this point in the reading. Right. But whatever Hairlock is using, it's nasty, and it was able to kill those ravens. And Crone comes to the realization, I guess, that Hairlock is out there looking for something in the Gradurbi Hills, and they talk about that. I'm sorry. That's a, that's a little bit incorrect. It pursues a power I could not approach, and whatever this power, it strikes directly for the Gadrobi Hills. There are two players out in the plains, and the puppet is following one of them. So whatever Hairlock is following is striking straight for the Gadrobi Hills. Okay. So who are the two players? I thought it was Hairlock and the Malazans. 
well, it's going to be Lorne and Tool. Right. We didn't understand exactly. We thought maybe she was going to Darugistan, but Darugistan's just in the same direction as the Gadrobi Hills from where she is. Right. So she apparently is heading straight for the hills, and Hairlock is following her. And they're looking for a barrow. They don't understand because they're not natives, right? Right. We've got Crone and Anamander Rake who have this information because Crone delivered it because she witnessed what was going on. And he's like, you better talk to Baruch because we're not locals. We don't know what's going on and why they're heading there. Baruch knows exactly where they're going and why. And he knows how to get there also. But he's not willing to give that information up. He wants to give crone the information of where these people are going to end up this is the information that baruch is willing to give animator rake but he's not willing to give the information where the barrow is because that information can destroy a city like darujistan people have tried and tried they've dug all around the starting point which let's let's describe what the starting point is it's essentially it's a plinth 20 feet high and there's only like a hand span of the stone still sticking out of the plane so but all yeah all around it people have been digging and and doing these exploratory tunnels and stuff trying to figure out where the entrance to the barrow is but that's just the starting point crone has revealed her information which is that there are two players going to the hills and baruch has revealed his information that he knows what they're looking for, which is that Jagged Tyrant's burial ground or his barrow. And then we come to the conclusion that Baruch knows where the actual barrow is and probably how to get in. But he's not going to share that information with Anamander Rake because he says Anamander Rake's motives are questionable. He doesn't know. There's not a lot of trust there. Just because they have an alliance doesn't mean he's just going to freely give this information. He's concerned that his city will be destroyed if something were to get out of that barrow. And who is he referring to when he says there is a man in this city that has collected all of the pertinent information regarding this barrow and this tyrant? Cole. I mean, uh, Mamet? Uh, when you say Cole, I was like, really? <laughs> Cole obviously is a wealth of trivia. Yeah, he's good for the bar. Good on trivia night? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Flying fortresses in the sky for 500. <laughs> um, can you guys look at the, I don't know, third paragraph on page 278 that begins, Crone bobbed her head? Yeah. Um, you say that as though you noticed this section, and so did I. And let's talk about this section. Well, the last question was, the puppet, are you certain it pursues this power? And Crone bobbed her head. That and said, yes, it does pursue that power. It tracks it. It hides when necessary. But then she questioned him, and it says, you assume both powers are Malazan. Why? So anyway, they're disagreeing. They, they comprehend the facts. They're disagreeing what the facts mean. I think they're just coming to terms together. I think they're figuring it out at the okay, same time. Okay, I can see that. All right. Fair, fair yeah, enough. they're just working it out. Look how astute she is. We, we asked questions about her in the beginning, whether she could read minds or if she was just super wise. Which do you think this is an example of? Wise. Wise. Yeah, super, super wise. She's able to just look at him and determine what he's thinking based on his questions. Mm. And the stuff that he volunteers to her. He didn't say anything about both of them being Malazan. But then he goes on to explain why he thinks both of them are Malazan. But she picked that up just by, just by looking at him. Oh, she, she's pulling it out of him. Yeah. Okay. He, he thinks that both of them are Malazan. One's following the other surreptitiously. And she's like, why do you think this? And then he goes on and explains it. She is such a smart bird. I think you're right. Yeah, she's pulling it out of him, and he's more than willing to tell her. Well, she is a master spy, as you suggested. What else do we have in this section? Um, Just one thing I just want to point out, perhaps foreshadowing, although it seems to me it's fairly obvious at this point, where Baruch says, I wouldn't doubt that there are competing factions within the Empire. Any political entity as large as that one is bound to be rife with discord. And it is. Right? It is. It's practically falling apart at the seams. And it's being... And my impression is that the, Mal the Malazan Empire is barely held together. Well, it's not... I mean, that just means, you know, there's cracks. I mean, there's always... There's bound to be, regardless... Maybe it's like the Barbican, right? It's got cracks in it, but it's still very, very solid. Huh. All right, so... 
Crone decides to leave. She's given her information. She's gotten her information, and she hops on the windowsill and flies away. And Baruch, he like slams the. <laughs> he tries to. Well, he does it. Like, yeah, exactly. Anyway, she's gone. That scene is over. Well, and then he contacts Mamet. Yeah, so we go back in time again. Right. The previous section should have followed this section and did in in logical timeline. And then he's like, "Oh, I see Krupp's with you. Why don't you send him over too while you're at it?" <laughs> I like that. So after he slams the gate shut, he's talking about, "Oh, he had just summoned a demon." I'm me personally. I'm like horrified at that. I'm like, "Summon a demon? Uh, evil, evil, evil." Well, it's funny you should say that about him because, like, later on, I come to my final assessment of Baruch. Are we talking about this now? No, no, not yet. I, I, there's got to be something else out there than, like, the penultimate of evil. I don't know what demons are anymore in this book. That's the only thing I can say about that, you know. Eh, well, what's a demon? Something otherworldly. Exactly. It's an extra planar creature. They're just blanket term, all called demons. Who knows? Like, why Why do you care? I don't know, but the Morants seem like the... MFers of the bunch, <laughs> you know. No, I think the Malazans sound like the biggest dicks on the playing ground right now. Oh well, they're not so great either. Yeah, I'm not sure where to cast stones here, but it did wig me out. I couldn't let it go, so I had to mention it. I think it's weird that that wigs you out, man. Well, I don't think it's weird. It's just mine is a little bit more personal than that. But I, again, you're not going to talk about that now exactly. because it's not. Yeah, I got it. So let's not talk about this stuff anymore. And move on, yeah. All right, fine. Quick Ben, true to his name, seeks an audience with a deity. Shadow Throne, right? So if you guys will recall, please, towards the end of the last chapter, Quick Ben and Kalam had gathered in a squatter's shack that is adjoining to Quip's bar, which is like right along the waterfront. It's just this ramshackled, made out of driftwood junk shack that they've kind of like rented or whatever. And it was from here that Quick Ben departed. And he said to Kalam, if I do not return, burn my body to ash. Yeah. This is the direct continuation of that scene. But now Quick Ben is in the shadow realm. When we last left him, there was a howling of hounds. And at the beginning of this section, the hounds show up. Well, one of them is just right in front of it him. It is. Uh, there's a lot of description of each one. We could either go through them or we could just say he has he meets most of them and also lets everybody know that he knows their name. I, yeah, I don't really think getting hung up on their names and stuff is particularly important. It doesn't sound like he's ever met them before, but he knows every single one by sight as if he has studied them somehow. Obviously he has. Which is unusual, right? Because it sounds like... There's other people in the Empire who's never even heard of these things. Most people don't know they exist. Exactly. Whoa. And even people like Tattersail, who knows that they exist, she doesn't know what their names are. And he knows them all by sight, which, yeah. even though he's never seen them, that's incredible. These towns, if you will, lead him to... Before we get there, let's describe the Warren. The land around them changed slowly, slipping in and out of sourceless shadow... And as he headed what direction he thought was north, there was a gray forest that climbed a slope to what might have been a wall. And then he says that it seems like it's bounded magically. There are black clouds that ride the wind above him. They seem like they're farther away than they should be, but the wall seems to be closer than how far away the uh, clouds should be. And do you guys remember that there was some confusion in the beginning about the realm of shadow being Mayanus, I think it was, which was the realm of illusion? I do. Well, anyway, so this thing seems like it's, it's locked away. It's somehow magically separate. There's kind of like a hologram or an illusion going on that shows the clouds and the forest and all this kind of stuff. Quigbin comes over a rise, still following the dogs, and there on the plain before him is Shadow Keep. He said it rose from the plain like an enormous lump of black glass, fractured with curving planes, rippled in places, with some corners glistening white as if crushed. He said something else that was interesting about it as well. Yes, just as the image carved upon the altar within the temples dedicated to the Shadow Throne. So he has seen these temples for himself, obviously. It's shortly after that that he is convinced to walk through the wall of this place. There is no gate. There is no portcullis. 
It's just a wall. He follows one of the dogs through it, and then he's inside of Shadow Keep, and he describes it as a long hallway that could have been in any palace or castle anywhere. Yeah. And he's on his way to meet Shadow Throne, who sits in this large, very large domed chamber. He describes Shadow Throne there, too. Have we seen Shadow Throne before since the prologue? I mean, we've seen him, but he wasn't really described before now. When What's-His-Name died. Yeah, Perrin. It's not much of a description. It just says that, he, I mean, he appears like Shadow. Right. Like he's got a kind of insubstantial form that changes, and his, his hood is covering what would be his eyes, but Quick Ben can feel his attention exclusively on him. Well, the image is different, but the, the, the one connecting descriptor is that it said the god giggled. Well, that's how we know he's the crazy emperor, right? Yeah. Because he giggles like an idiot or a crazy person. Uh, the dog Shan talks to Shadow Throne mentally. Yeah, mentally, and and Shadow Throne says that he knows that Quick Ben knows all the dogs' names. Why does he know their names? Well, because we find out that he was an acolyte of Shadow Throne at one time. Is that a wise thing to admit? Well, no, it's not because he knows that to begin upon the path of Shadow and then to leave it is rewarded by the rope. Definitely gonna die. Uh, so why is he here though? What is what does Quick Ben want? Shadow Throne asks him directly. And Quick Ben ultimately wants something else, but he goes a long way around in order to get it. So Shadow Throne asks why I shouldn't just kill you right now. And Quick Ben says, because I have a deal for you. And Shadow Throne's all, well, no reason why I shouldn't kill you. And he's all, oh, I know because you like to make deals. And Shadow Throne is like, oh, you really were an acolyte of mine. <laughs> you do pay attention. So... They get into a little barter, a little exchange. And so the first thing that Quick Ben says is, how is gear? And everybody wakes up. All the hounds are like, what? And uh, Shadow Throne's like, gear's alive. And and you have my attention. And you know, you've piqued my curiosity, something that hasn't happened in a long, long time. And Quick Ben says, I can give you to the person who did this to Gear. But we're not talking about Perrin, you know, the person who actually hurt the dog with the sword. Well, that's what Shadow Throne thinks. Yeah, well, it's not that because there was somebody that actually made that whole scenario occur. And without saying his name, he's talking specifically about Hairlock. They go into this whole exchange and basically... Uh, Quick Ben's life is not forfeit if he can make this whole thing happen. He wants the hounds to show up at just the right time, and he'll let them know when that will occur. Just as he's leaving, Quick Ben says, Hey, I wasn't really an acolyte. I was high up in your service. You'll not have me, Lord, because you can't. And then he goes away, and he's all, It's you, Delot, you shape-shifting bastard. And that's how this part ends. The verbal sparring here and the games they're playing is just absolutely amazing. I'm tickled to bits on this whole exchange between Quick Ben and Shadow Throne, and he tricks him. He does trick him. Well, just the fact that he would enter into negotiations, like, that is temerity. Well, he knows this guy's frailties also. You may be a god, but you still suffer from some indignities that humans do also. You mean like obviously. ignorance? Sometimes, uh, yeah. maybe just liking to roll the dice, you know? I went through this multiple times because, again, this is one of my favorite scenes of the whole book. When Quickbin says, I can offer you the person who hurt gear. And he said, in exchange for what? And he said, to lift the rope's reward from my head. And then you go through this whole dialogue after that. And he said, no, first, before I answer your question over why you can't kill me, you have to promise me you will follow the terms of agreement. And he's like, fine, I'll follow the terms of your agreement. And it was at that moment, Shadow Throne was incapable of harming him. And he said, you can't hurt me because you can't. Like, you just agreed <laughs> to my proposal. So I'm out of here. Poof. And he pops out. And, you know, the other thing is, is that Shadow Throne, is, he liked this. I mean, he really does. Because before he knew it was Quick Ben, he says, Your cunning is admirable, wizard. I am astonished, and I must admit, delighted by this duel. He played him like a fiddle, I think they say. He also expresses remorse that he left his church. And there's a point here that I don't get, and it may come up at a later time, but he, um, Shadow Throne calls Quick Ben out by the name Delot, but he also calls him a shapeshifter. He must have had to have shapeshifted in this chapter, but I didn't realize. Like, they never described Quick Ben here. By one means or another, he is not the form of Delot that Shadowthrow knew in the past. Exactly. 
Definitely. Well, he's he is not in his body. Like he did he did not show up here as a physical person. Right. Well, that's true. I just kind of assume, you know, if I leave my body and there's any manifestation visually, it will still look like me, just a little bit more ethereal or something. Oh, I didn't think Apparently about it. Apparently so, not. So if I project myself astrally, I can look like Brad Pitt. <laughs> Uh, this was a great part of the chapter, and I also kind of, uh, if you read the Crone and Baruch part, and you even look at the the tete a tete between uh, Krupp and Mamet, there's a lot of verbal sparring going in this part, this chapter. I'd, I'd go so far as to say friction. I like this a lot. Yeah, this chapter when we were talking about last week, I wasn't that into it. But reading and rereading it and listening to it really changed my opinion of it. Well, nuance does help, right? Right. Well, okay, so I have to bring up a couple of things that I did not comprehend at this point in time. Quickbin knows that Gear was stabbed, but I went back and I reread that chapter, and the bridge burners left pale before that event occurred. So how did he know about it? Because he debriefed Hairlock at the Spar of Andy. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, okay. I remember that now. And that's how we knew Herlock tried to steal his soul and so on and so forth. Yep. Okay, yeah, you're right. Never mind. Thanks for answering that. Delivering slippery tidings, Krupp meets with Baruch, who gives him his marching orders. All right, so we're back with Baruch in his study. Crone has recently departed... Krupp, who was too dignified to do more than walk from Mammoth, has finally arrived and is now before Baruch. And he wants to know, what is what news do you have for me? Yeah, he wants to know about the eel, really, right? Krupp says that the protection is ongoing. And by the way, I have a message for you from the eel. And then you're right. Then he says, the, but they can't figure out, they have no luck in finding out who the Malazan infiltrators are. Which is a lie. Right, because he has a message that he gives him. Oh, he saw them outside of Brooks. Anyway, the message, though, let me let me just say it. it. He says, look to the streets to find those you seek. That's the message from the eel, yeah. Krupp is then asked by Baruch what he knows of the eel. Did you? Okay, so there's there's this funny little moment when he says, oh, Jesus, he even knows who my agents are. Right. <laughs> That's how out of depth Baruch is compared to the eel. Remember, you talked about it just a second ago. There's a lot of friction. I mean, he had a cranky engagement with Crone just a moment ago, and now here he is with Krupp, who he knows is a difficult person to talk to. <laughs> and here it is. He's being shown that the eel knows who his agents are, and like he's just kind of feel. I think he's feeling a little out of his depth, and I don't think he's used to that. This is a man who, like, he runs things in this town. What does Krupp know of the eel? Well, he doesn't know the gender, he, she, I don't know. They're described as perpetuating a status quo defined by aversion to tyranny. Yeah, and overall protecting Darujistan. And that the eel must have hundreds of people working for them. That may be so, but I get the hint he's really exaggerating here and overinflating. But who knows? Well, he's just saying there's rumor, innuendo, conjecture... All over the place, and that's what Krupp is suggesting here, I think. Philip's point, though, that this is an exaggeration may, may be true, and Krupp is not unprone to exaggeration, I would say, but... He's mythifying. It's fair turf, though, because nobody knows anything about the eel. He can say whatever he wants, essentially, and get away with this kind of stuff. But on top of that, he probably does. The eel probably does have hundreds of agents. In order to know the kinds of things that the eel knows, I mean, Circle Breaker is... Just one of those people we've met. As far as the eel is concerned, Baruch might be an agent. Hey, you got me there. The proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Baruch, Mamet, all of them, they're unknown agents of the eel. Yeah, so what do all the agents of the eel have kind of in common right now that's not necessarily a good thing? They are all homing in on the coin bearer? What? I don't know. They're all being hunted by turban ore. Oh, well, okay, yeah, that's true. Not important, huh? Well, no, it's important because... Baruch wants the coin bearer protected at all costs. You think those things are related? Sure, why not? I mean, we brought it up. I'm bringing up the thing about Turban Ore because this is the way that we find out about the threats to the agents. It's just a throwaway statement from Krupp. 
Okay, so you just mentioned the coin bearer and the protection of the coin bearer. We see here that there's a reason behind it that's kind of like laid out and explained to us. Since it's a person that is being played by Opon, right? You want to make sure that that doesn't go to some other person later on. So you want to keep tabs on this person. What was it? Something about ascendance. If one is in the area, then more are going to get into play. They're concerned about a power vacuum, for one thing. And then they're concerned that the coin bearer is like a vulnerability of a pawns. Mm -hmm. That an ascendant can get to a pawn through the coin bearer. Oh, that's which right. is why the coin bearer needs to be protected. And if somebody gets to Opon, as Caladam Brood pointed out, then there will be a power vacuum, and it would draw in entities powerful enough to oppose Rake, which would potentially destroy the city, which is what they're trying to avoid. These people are protecting Darujistan. That's their goal. Like, that's what Baruch's goal is, and we just got the information from the eel that that's also the eel's goal. Which doesn't coincide with Baruch's plans. No, it does. It does. Does it? Because he's not happy. Maybe with not the... the specifics. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, how they go about their plans, they're two different entities with two different ideas, but they have the same exact goal. Protect Darujistan and thwart tyranny. And this is the second time we've gotten that information about them having that stuff, exact stuff in common. Circle Breaker pointed it out a long time ago. This section is, is kind of muddled, in my opinion. We're getting information about the eel. We're getting information about the coin bearer and other ascendants and all this kind of stuff. And we know now what Baruch really, really wants. We know why he's trying to protect the coin bearer, but he has something else in his mind, right? Because he's just learned from Crone that there are Malazan agents, two sets of them, in fact, heading to the Gudrobi Hills, and he thinks he knows why. And he needs to protect Darujistan, remember? That's what he's after. So how is he planning on going about that? Keeping the coin bearer safe and protecting Darujistan at the same time. So taking him out of the city will... The convergence won't take place in Darujistan. Is that what you're getting at? I think that's what he's doing. He's sending the coin bearer out of town. His agents can keep an eye on him there, but he's like, get him out of the city. Keep him safe. Do not be noticed. But watch these people. If they are discovered, you know, the, the coin bearer's... Uh, presence is known they are told to kill him if the coin bearer's influence turns against us kill him that's the instruction and that's where i'm like baruch is like that's a straw you know that's the last straw you know it's one thing to you know consort with demons and stuff like that but if you're gonna kill the kid that we all love be a good guy just win the love of this lady turn his life around exactly turn his life around and Baruch's just willing to sacrifice him just like that. Um, Baruch. To protect the city. Yeah, but... He doesn't care on. about the coin bearer. He's a pragmatist. I'm not on Baruch's side anymore. He, he's also a summoner of demons. So Exactly. How, <laughs> how good can he be? Why didn't he summon an angel? I mean, honestly. Hey, do you remember, do you remember what Crocus stole from the Da'aral daughter that he wanted to keep for himself? Oh, that was... turban with feathers on it or something? It was a turban. It was a turban. So now start thinking about a hundred or thousand and one Arabian Nights, and Efrites and genies and etc. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it, okay. So there are your demons. Not a big deal, man. It's not like you're summoning Satan and it's a pact with evil. I don't know, but there's two things on here. One, the he said the word luck another third time. So the first time Krupp mentioned it was when he was in Mammoth study. Mammoth said. I will not inquire or tease your luck. And Krupp said, luck is such a dreadful companion these days. And the second time he mentioned it was when he was talking to Baruch and he said, as to the presence of the Malazan infiltrators, he said, no luck there, which we know that's not true. And the third time he mentioned it, he said, Ralk appears to be temporarily indisposed, but with luck, he shall be available. And I've been thinking about this. And do you remember what Gruul said in the dream of the last chapter when he said that younger gods can't reach your mind? And I wonder if Krupp heard that and now he's feeling a little brazen, maybe invulnerable. Maybe Opan is a young god. I don't know. The point is, it's weird that he, of all people, would tempt the gods with that word. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, I do know what you're saying. Maybe it's not a temptation. Maybe he's trying to get their attention. That is also possible. 
I had the impression Opan was an older god, but... I mean, the the amount of power that they possess is ridiculous, so I don't, I don't know. I think Opan would be everywhere, all the time, across the oh, planet. Yeah. I don't know if that means Elder, though. I have no idea. Maybe every single time he says the word, it's trying to grab attention to a pawn. I think you maybe you have a point. It's the opposite of trying to antagonize. Go unnoticed. Them. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, maybe mm. maybe trying to be noticed. Good point. Okay, so I mean, it's something to think about, but like, I don't know. Like, what's the first one again? When he was in Mammoth's study. Okay, so why would he want their attention right then and there? Like, what would? Why would he want their attention there with the five black dragons? There may be something there. I don't know. I think it's unusual because I had not picked that up before, and you told me to start paying attention to words, and I'm, I'm, I'm turns of phrases. Yeah. Yes. So sure. there I am. Okay, that's fair. Do you, is there more, Philip? Did you have anything else, or would I be interrupting if I moved on? Well, not with the luck. It would be the very last thing of the entire section. Oh, yeah, I understand. Okay, let's talk about that. When they talked about killing the boy, and Krupp said, we've discussed it, and Baruch inclined his head and fell silent, and then Krupp just, quiet, Krupp just quietly left. I think this is the first instance of Krupp letting his guard down. Or the second time, maybe, really. Might be. I maybe I didn't catch the first. Well, one. no. the The first one was when he was talking out loud, and Mamet could have heard could have heard him. Oh, that's true. He could hear the pages turning in the yeah. other room, and Krupp is speaking out loud, which means Mamet probably did overhear him. Mule. That's a very good point. Well, I you know well the first time when he was talking to himself might have been a lapse of sanity, but here I see a lapse of character at the very end when Krupp normally delays and he hymns and haws. And he has to be pretty much forced to leave. Here, he just, like, shuts his mouth and quietly leaves. And I think, to Crocus's point... Crocus's point? Crocus. Crocus said he's never seen him slip in his Uh, character. Okay. And here, I think he did. He's letting his humanity out. He's saying it just hurts him that that is a possibility that he has to... That he might have to execute so I, I hear what you're saying i i understand now what you were aiming at and i will say that i read that a little differently go on when he's given the directive that if the influence turns against us kill the boy krupp doesn't say yep okay no sweat he says we've discussed it which is not an affirmation He's like, we've already taken care of this. We've already thought of this thing before you mentioned it. And maybe they have a different plan. And that, okay. And so he's just like keeping quiet so he can. Yep. Yeah, exactly. All right. Keeping quiet and just walking away so that the, Baruch can go off on his own tangent, whatever it is he's thinking. He didn't confirm it. He didn't deny it. He just says, I've already considered this. And, and then he leaves. And now he's sneaking away without drawing yeah. attention to himself. Right. Okay. I can see that. Right. All right, so let's go backwards a little bit into the chapter, and let's talk about a confusing bit there at the bottom of 282. It's not really the bottom. It's like the lower third of 282. It kind of begins, yes, Paramount is the coin bearer. Um, Krupp cleared his throat. What are we to observe, Master? So he's been told to go to the Gadrobi Hills, and Baruch is like, you will go there, and it's possibly a foreign work party digging here and there. And Krupp says, as in road repairs, yeah. question mark. <laughs> so is he, okay, so for our listeners, what I'm driving at here is they seem to not understand what each other are talking about. Krupp seems to be suggesting that the eel has already pointed out something to Baruch that Baruch is not picking up. So Krupp's driving the point home. Hey, look to the streets for these guys that you're looking for. And then Baruch's like, you're going to go out into the Gadrobi Hills. And he's like, you mean road work? I got that. You will mentioned it earlier. We didn't follow up on that. But you will mentioned it earlier. When you look at the very next line, the alchemist frowned. I think the alchemist is already on to him. He was watching the people in the streets. I don't think he got it, man. You I don't, don't think he got you it. You don't think so? Not really. No, not, not in this moment. I don't know. I think he's frowning because he's had a rough, rough go of it very, very recently. Okay. Let's, let's replay that line by line though. He said, I'm not sure, possibly a foreign work party 
digging here and there. That's exactly what they were doing. I yeah, th- but that's what... No, no, no. Think about it. He is sending his agents out to the Gudrobi Hills looking for a foreign work party who's going to be digging around. That's what they're going to be doing. They're looking for the Barrow. And when he doesn't get it, Krupp is like, hey... We're talking about road repairs here, and wink, wink, nod, nod, and he still doesn't get it. He's like, I'm sending you to the Gadrobi Hills. So they're either talking about two different things, and neither one of them understands what the other one is saying, or Krupp is being really, really subtle and trying to make Brook think that it's his idea. So you think this is some like cruel joke of the gods that are talking about the exact same thing, but two different things? No, I'll, I'll state it again. What I think is going on here is that Baruch is not picking up what Krupp is putting down. Okay. Krupp is trying to communicate something to him very subtly. He wants it to be Baruch's idea. He doesn't want to tell him. He says, we don't know who the Malazans are. Wink, wink, nod, nod. The eel knows. I'm sorry. If you were sitting in your window staring at a road construction crew who didn't know what they were doing and you were looking at them for a long period of time, would you know that they didn't know? Or would you just say, oh, you know... No, because when he ended that section, he said, curses to you, lady, Lassine, empress, whatever. I'll find your agent someday. And that's how it ended. Okay, you got me there. Okay. He didn't know. All right. He still doesn't know. He still hasn't figured it out, even though Krupp is trying to tell him. I don't get why he doesn't get it. I get why you're saying what you're saying. And I agree that that is how the story is going. I don't know. Maybe he's just so high-minded that he can't see the stuff right in front of him. Oh, true. He's looking at the. He's looking at the big picture. Yes. He's willing to kill Crocus. He's willing to just end this coin bearer to protect his city. Boo. Eighteen. I think you're right, but uh, I think it was. Tri- I'm ready to move on. I think it was trickily written. But isn't Krupp a tricky guy? Well, certainly, Krupp is. Yes. Safely return from the Warren of Shadow, Quick Ben is immediately discovered by Sari. Now, would that make you nervous? Yeah. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Well, not only that, but he's like recovering immediately and doesn't have the power to really access Warrens. But seriously, like holy hot dogs. I mean, you come, you wake up and one of the first things you see is the rope. <laughs> so he just escaped from Shadow Throne seconds ago. He's like, ha ha, nani, 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 thumb in his nose at Shadow Throne. He shows back up and they're gloating. Yeah, I was successful. <laughs> I'm so good. And then there's Sari standing in the doorway. Like I would, I would poop my pants. <laughs> oh yeah, they were gloating because Quick Ben said, you know, you should have heard him scream. <laughs> He's so upset. And then Callum says, well, well, are you surprised how many high priests burn their robes of their vestment? So he had every reason to know what the inside of the temples looked like. He has every reason to know the names of those dogs. Yeah. He did not lie to Shadow Throne. He was an acolyte. Yeah, at- he had been an acolyte at one time. Yes, and then he evolved to become a high priest. Oh, I love this man. God, he's incredible. Let's talk about how she found them. Yes? So Sari sensed his, his power, and Quick Man was like, What? I put up a shield so that nobody would be able to find me. And... She often can't sense where he is. She, she well, admits she, this. She said as much, that usually I can't find you. Right. But in this case, cracks appeared, and I could taste your flavor. But that's not really how it goes. So, like, we're getting an idea that the rope doesn't... The rope must not be a wizard. No, it's not just that, but, like, like in a normal conversation, like, she shows up out of the blue and she says that, I'd be like... I'd be dropping a loaf. I mean, seriously, I'd be peeing my pants. This cold-hearted killer's like, I have a hard time finding you when you're doing that. Which means she does, she tries to find them all the time. Well, anytime they go somewhere, she's probably hunting them down. Exactly. Initially, they're like, how'd you guys, how'd you find us, Sorry, Sorry said that the captain sent her to get them. Whiskey Jack. And Callum and Quickben are like, nobody knew we were here. And she immediately switches to, all right, you got me. <laughs> I sensed where you were, and then that whole thing, you know, built the way it did. Okay, so why though? Like, let's explain why she was able to sense them. According to Quick Ben's assessment, how did he assess how she found him? When Quick Ben entered the realm of shadow, no matter how tenuous of a connection that was, there was a brief opening in reality in her existence 
where the, it leaked out. You just can't stop it. And so she homed in on that. And I think that's where the, that was the exact same time that Crocus dropped his coin on the bar and she reacted violently. There was that burst of power that came from her. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Now she reacted violently to it. Oh, like an echo almost. Something, uh, a sound with shockwave, something. That's how she homed in on Quickbin was because when he entered the realm of shadow, she could detect that. She may not have understood it, but she could certainly feel it. And that's how she found him. But only because she is associated with shadow herself. Yes. Only somebody associated with shadow has the sensitivity to detect that brief of a transition or whatnot. Yes. So Sari tells the boys that she marked the assassin that they're looking for. So it turns out she found them coincidentally for legitimate business. Yeah, legitimately. She's not there to kill Quickman or Kalam or any of that nonsense. She's like, oh, that's convenient. There you are. Yeah, by the way, I found this guy you were looking for. Now go do your job. Well, they're like, come on with us. We'll we'll go do this since you know what we're doing. Uh And she's like, no, I've got something else to do. <laughs> yeah, well, that something else is legitimate. Earlier in the day, she was told by Whiskey Jack to follow Krupp. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to go shenanigans that. If she's supposed to follow Krupp, why in the hell is she going way the hell out here just to... Hold on. Let's figure out where Krupp is right now. He's at Baruch's, right? Yeah, the timeline it's gets... It's nighttime. Timeline is messed up. I mean, we can figure it out, though. Krupp and Baruch are probably talking right now. They might be. It doesn't really matter. The point is, if she's asked to follow somebody, I mean, you follow Maybe them. Maybe she knows exactly where he is, and now she's going to go back about her job. The point is, there'll always be a gap when she goes to do a task and then comes back to perform her previous task. She is the rope, and so maybe her skills at, like, following and keeping track of people are real good. Maybe. I call sh- I call story shenanigans on that, but okay. I don't. Okay, and this is why. This is why I don't. On a normal person, she's not going to have any problem finding or tracking somebody down right? None. She has pointed out the fact that she can't usually find the wizard, but that's because he's actively blocking her. Oh. He's actively got a shield up to prevent her from finding him. Touche. And so normally, if she wants to keep track of somebody, I'm guessing it's just a matter of, okay, I'm following Krupp now. Where is he? Okay, there he is. Let's go see what he's up to. Touche. Touche. You got me there. Yeah. The only way Quick Ben can hide is if he puts up a shield. And even then... <laughs> Woo, depending on where he goes, he might be leaking a little bit of extra extra scent for her to follow. Yeah, you're right on that one. Just that one. I'm so proud. Thanks, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> All right. So we've got we've talked about her job and what their job was. They've been directed towards the Phoenix Inn and an assassin who's in residence there right now. When she leaves, when she walks away, they're relieved, right? They're like stress off and quick ben says she's the one that we thought her to be so far so good what does that tell you what do you what's the sensation that you get when he says so far so good and they're talking about sorry being the rope she's doing what they want her to do i think yes exactly she's become part of their plan they're using her in their plan and they guessed correctly about who she was, and so far, so good. My God, I was just like, honestly, like he just outsmarted Shadow Throne. <laughs> he just outsmarted Shadow Throne. And the rope. And the rope. <laughs> I mean, that was like a what do they call that when you shave your knuckles? You know, like that's a super close call. All of that stuff that just happened is a super close call. It's called a gambit, and you know what? In my next life, I want to be Quick Ben. Ralik Nam spies a foreign assassin, but who marked whom? Okay, so we're back in the Phoenix Inn, and Ralik is there, and Marilio is there, and Cole is drunk, passed out at the table again. When in walks, let's say it's Kalam, right? Because I'm pretty sure it's who we're supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, you know, they, they said he was a heavy set man, and I know that he was wide. I just didn't know it was... And they said he was very nimble for being so wide earlier in the... Tattersail sp- described him as a bear. Let's look at more like a linebacker or tailback or something like that. I mean, just a beefy guy who's an athlete. 
So they're both being extraordinarily obvious, though. So when Kalam walks in, I mean, it's obvious that he's marked Ralik, and Ralik obviously has marked Kalam. And they're both like going out of their way to be obvious. And Ralik is like, what is going on here? This is this is ridiculous. Like, who's the bait? He's feeling baited by this guy and he's trying to bait this guy. And then he starts to wonder who this guy is. He could be from Kalos. He could just be a southerner from this continent, but he could just as easily be from the seven cities because both both areas have dark skinned people. And then he's like, yeah, he could be a Malazan. Because they're thinking the claw are in town. He also mentions uh, his daggers, uh, or his long knives, I should say, and how they're silver pommeled. Those weapons were anything but southern, and stamped on the pommels was the crosshatch pattern, recognizable to all within the trade as a mark of an assassin. So that must be a universal symbol. So something funny that he said, though, was when he's trying to figure out who this guy is and he's wondering whether or not he's claw or he's local or he's foreign or whatever. He says that so far there have been no survivors. There have been no eyewitnesses. So I ask the two of you, what is Crocus? Wait, 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 what are you talking about? Say, say it again. Well, he's an eyewitness. Technically, he saw stuff going down, but he was not an assassin. Does that mean that they just don't believe Crocus? Did he? Did Crocus tell the story? Because remember, he walked in there, and what did he say? Oh, typical knight. No, he he definitely told them that there was an assassin war going on. And they didn't believe him, or at least they were saying they didn't believe him. They told him to calm down, that the city was built on rumors. Okay, I don't know. I honestly but don't you're, know. You're, you follow now. I do follow what your, your logic here is, but um, I don't remember precisely what... Well, we've got the time. If you really want to look into it, it's not a problem to go back and look. But I assure you, he told them what he had seen, and they were like, nah, that's not a big deal. Well, then there's a disconnect, right? Because you don't have people, like, floating in the air and doing all these... Ma- I don't know. Or maybe you do. Okay, so maybe he said everything he saw, and exper- like, literally saw, and they said that's got to be Ma- Malazan, right? Maybe they just assumed it's Malazan. Seven foot tall, black skin, white hair, strange looking eyes. Yeah. That's what he would have described. Yeah, that's true. That doesn't really fit very well. No, it doesn't fit at all. It, well, it was dark. Oh, the black skin would be the only thing to fit. Seven feet tall? Give me a break, dude. I know. It's, it's not human. So they don't believe Crocus. That's, that's all I was trying to point out there. Okay, fair enough. No arguments there. Something's not right. Well, keep in mind, I mean, Ralik is being browbeat by his his guild, regardless of what Crocus has said. Well, they're told, they told him to go be obvious and to lure these people out. And now he's sitting here saying that there are no eyewitnesses, so this could be one of them. He's not really sure. Maybe this guy's claw. Well, just, I mean, how do we know Crocus? I think it was a, a, a literary inconvenience. Okay, fine. Is what I think. We don't know what Crocus said. It was implied that he told the story, but we don't... That is my only point, is that he was an eyewitness. He told the story. Krupp knows. Ralik knows. And Ralik is forgetting the fact that Krupp Crocus both know. I think you're right. If they really knew that he was the only person who saw the attackers, wouldn't he have been, like, grilled six ways from sideways? Or they're trying to protect him, and so they're trying to convince him that he didn't see anything, and they don't want him grilled. Mm. They don't want any attention on him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But for Ralik to forget it, I think, is weird. All right. So what? So what? He he spotted this guy. He goes to get some more beer. Ralik Nam goes through the kitchen, right? It's a little more complicated than that. He goes to get beer. He elbows that kid. The kid runs off, and then he drinks the beer with Marilio. And then shortly after, he goes out through the kitchen. Well, and just for the record, I think it's cool, right? So there's a predetermined signal. Yeah. Right? Oh, you you pointed this out a long time ago. I, this oh. bar is not just any old bar. Dude, this is this is this is the haven for assassins. It's a den of thieves. I love this. Yeah. And he gives that yeah. kid. The kid is in, right? The cooks oh, are in. I, never, I didn't realize that. Yeah, the cooks oh, are yeah. in. The okay. kid is in. The, the 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 servants are in. Everybody's in. What about those cooks? <laughs> what about those cooks, man? Because they're like when he goes through to the back to talk to Ocelot, they're like rolling their eyes at him, right? What is going? What is that? <laughs> what are they doing? They're just like, oh, this guy again. Yeah, exactly, right? They're like, oh, yeah. whatever, yeah. 
I, I didn't really understand what was that, but I think it gives some evidence to what you just suggested that everybody's in on it. They understand. They know who he is. They know what's happening. They know he's reporting to Ocelot, all that kind of stuff. Yep, and they're all looking out for each other. It's it's their own little family slash community. So Ocelot tells him he's not done, essentially. Go back in there. Make sure you're being really obvious. Vorkin's orders, and you lure these guys to such and such a place, and you go and you do it right now. And he's like dead stare letting him know that he thinks it's ridiculous stupid idea well relic nom says that he knows what he's doing and if he makes it so obvious that guy's gonna know that it's obvious and then it's gonna give away that he's trying to make this happen this way and he knows what he's doing too obvious you know you know how it is your boss always has to micromanage stuff Yes, and, and Ocelot Relic- has done nothing but micromanage the entire time we've known him. Exactly. So Relic Nom's like, you know, whatever. Flips him the bird, basically. Yep. <laughs> yep. All but. Comes through the kitchen, is really pissed off. And all the people that were laughing at him are not laughing at him anymore. Very serious, no eye contact, looking down at their work. All right, and he goes outside to make this guy again. And that dude's gone. Kalam is Kalam not is in gone. the bar. He's gone. <laughs> so once yeah. again, who was who was marking whom on this one? I think they might have just baited Ocelot, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's very likely because we never saw Quick Ben. No, there we was did no not. Mention- because at the end of the last section, uh, the first thing I'm going to do when I get to the Phoenix Inn is have, have a, a beer. beer. And Quick Ben said, "Agreed." And yeah. we haven't and- seen hide nor ha- hair of him. Which means that Ralik didn't mark Quick Ben. So Quick Ben could still be in there. Just saying. Yeah, Yeah, pretty good. Oh, so this is the Quick Ben chapter? Is that what this is all about? (laughs) Oh, it's pretty good. Yeah, I I don't know. Like, I haven't really given it that kind of thought yet, but uh, Quick Ben does shine in this chapter for sure. Yeah. Crocus contemplates two women and his future. All right, so Crocus is standing in an alley. He's got, uh, it, mind you, it's nighttime. It's been raining. It has been raining. And that's actually something, a consistent theme across the scenes that I did want to point out that I very much appreciate it as a reader. Scene over scene, you talk about the rain came, the rain gone, the things are so slick. I'm rarely a stickler for like details like that, but in this particular case, I am. Starting with... When Quick Ben was in the tent with Kalam, he said, oh, I didn't realize it rained. And then they talked about going out to the alleyway, and he said, oh, the rain was gone, but so on and so forth. And now we get to the very last scene, and he's talking about the rain is gone, but all the stones are slick. Little details like that, where it's like connects scenes together temporally with an event. I don't know. I picked up on that, the rain thing. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Please continue your thunder. Go ahead and set. And the, yes, it it had rain. Go ahead and that set the, day. Go ahead and set the scene. No, I, I'm not gonna. Like it's nighttime. This is the end. This is the very very end. What's Crocus doing? He's waiting. What's he waiting for? All the lights to go out in a particular room that he's had his eyes on <laughs> for no telling how long. No telling how long he's been sitting in that alley watching that window. He probably dreams of that window daily. <laughs> I suspect he does, yeah. Well, he's he's young and she's hot. <laughs> but the first thing he actually does while he's waiting is he ruminates on the girl in the bar that he saw with the bloody sword or dagger. Well, r- remember his resolve, right? He's like, he wants to return this treasure to this d- Darl daughter. Mm-hmm. And... He's resolved to go and do this. He went through a lot of effort to get that treasure, and now he's gone through a lot of effort to retrieve the treasure from the possible fence and then to return it. Like he has, he's double dipping. He has to essentially relive the experience and take all that risk again, and he gets nothing out of it except, you know, he wants to return this stuff. But he's starting to question his resolve now, and he wonders was it sorry? Was it seeing that woman with the bloody daggers? Like, was it the coin and that really unnatural state of affairs? Like, what was all that? He acknowledges that he doesn't understand what happened in that bar earlier. He doesn't get it. It was too unnatural. But he's he's losing his nerve. But at the end, he doesn't lose his nerve. He's like, he's got a countdown. He waits for 15 minutes after that light goes out and he starts climbing. Yeah. 
regardless of how wet the stones are, he's adept at doing that. Small A. Yes, small A. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, maybe. Uh, It depends. Beginning of the sentence or not. (laughs) (laughs) Going back to his resolve waning a bit, he, he does question or say, gosh darn it, if I only didn't take those few seconds and spy the look on the Darl girl like he did, he wouldn't be in this situation. Oh, and that may have been, Philip pointed that earlier, that may have been uh, Opon's doing. He didn't have to look at her, right? He had all the treasure, and then on the way out, he's like, whoop. The one thing I'll say is that uh, it's explained that he's, he, he's no stranger to ladies. So she just struck him in such a way. Maybe it is a pun. I don't know. The moonlight exactly. was falling on her. Hey, yeah. wait a minute. In Krupp's last dream, the moon was characterized almost as an entity of divine power, right? I'll agree with you. The moon was really bright and held in the sky overhead longer than seemed natural to Krupp. And the moonlight was illuminating the girl when Crocus was in her room last. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. Well, anyway, that's it, though. He just starts climbing the wall, and that ends the, that ends the chapter and the section. Done. Hmm. Well, actually, the very last sentence of the section connects us to the preamble in the very beginning of the, the chapter. Hold on. This is... Okay, so you're talking about the, the, the conclusion poem. that you drew between the preamble and this section. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I think that, that right. we, we, we talked about this section as being like, why is this yeah. section here? Yes. Let now me, I think I know. Allow me to preface that I think that this is a very weak ending to a chapter and I have made my thoughts known and Philip has found something. Please do explain. Um, no, I agree. It seems incredibly out of place, but at least it connects the beginning preamble to the very nah, last sentence. You're right. I see it. I totally see it. He climbed on and did not slip even so much as a single foothold. Exactly. So he made all the right moves, and he's walking Thieves Road or whatnot, right? Let's read the preamble again. Walk with me on Thieves Road. Hear its song underfoot. How clear its tone and misstep as it sings you in two. Well, he did not make a misstep. He made them all. He did, but I wonder if Absalar is upset that Opan is is interfering with this boy's future. I mean, Absalar is the what the the princess of thieves, queen of thieves, whatever she is, lady of thieves, and she might be losing him if he becomes the uh, scholarly type that he wants to become, so he can impress this girl. Ooh. If Opan's involved, then uh, then this is something that's upsetting. <laughs> to her <laughs> it may very well be that crocus is one of one of uh Absalar's shining yeah pupils acolytes uh, atn are you impressed i made that connection yeah no it's a good one it's a good one thank you thank you guys i am accustomed to not understanding those things oh for me i'm like 10 times less accustomed than you are to understanding those things so when i get something i'm like oh my god i found something yeah um but i thought there might be something else in there it says if you make a misstep it sings you in two yeah, that sounds dangerous well he's got this conflicting idea over what what path he should take in life well he's ambivalent well i mean in this one he definitely has doubts I mean, more than ambivalent. I don't know. I mean, to me, that just means he's torn between two things. Well, he was torn, but but he had to steal himself to make it happen. His resolve was rocked, but he went it, through it anyway. Like, he came through, he came out the other side. Like, it was. it's kind of like mm-hmm. Perrin at the field of the massacre, right? Mm-hmm. Where he came out the other side whole like he made it out like as an adult and here we have something kind of similar it's like a rite of passage almost for crocus it might be that winds down this chapter which is still a middle chapter for the section assassins i think we have one more to go i think you're right yes it is and then we move on to book five so okay so that, that's that's pretty good guys do you guys have anything else that you want to cover or talk about in this section no i think we got that pretty good don't you Nailed it. Nailed it. I don't know that we nailed it, but 
I well, feel pretty good. It was a short chapter, and I don't think there was anything in there that was particularly mind-blowingly difficult. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, a lot of it is just reiterating what we already know, or allowing other characters, allowing us to know what other characters definitely know or assume. Right. right. And how it's all going to play out together. It's putting the pieces in place, also, or at least it definitely. feels that way. So you guys ready to wind it down? I am ready. All right. Hey, everybody, thank you for your comments. We love every single one of them. Uh, appreciate that, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. So thank you for joining us for this episode, and keep reading, everybody. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.